you got to understand what the customers want. And, and so really, I've given up my desk at the uh, office. I mean, I don't know if you guys realize that, but I, I, don't, I, don't, I go to the office for meetings, and beyond that, I'm in the office or in the, um, the store locations now, you know, with the majority of my time. It's a lot more fun there anyway. There were a couple things people were always wanting to know too. So first of all, how can you make a living selling mattresses? The second one is, my gosh, you were so young. How did you get people to even take you seriously? Well, I think there's a lot of benefits to being young when you're starting out, right? I mean, there's a, it takes a lot of energy and, um, you know, at that time the kids weren't born yet and so all I had to do was work. So uh, it seemed to me to be the best way to, to stay productive. And um, so I think early on, you know, there were some challenges with that, but, but after a certain period of time, they maybe, um, maybe they thought that I wasn't the smartest kid on the block, but they knew that I was going to work hard and that I had a lot of stick to itiveness and that I was going to be just fine. So we ended up getting a lot of support early on. The other one was, you know, you're a female in a, in a male dominated industry, and then it, it is a male dominated industry and it continues to be. Um, but I think early on, it, it would, there were more challenges. Obviously, after you go through time, it, it gets a little bit better. Um, better to the point that today I almost joke with these guys who are now my mentors, and I say to them, you know, that it, most of our customers are women. You know, women, 80% of the decisions are made by women. So we need to have a lot more female executives in our industry. But, you know, my whole goal really is to see women advance to more leadership positions, uh, not necessarily in our industry, uh, but across the board. So I do a lot of advocating for that. I sit on some uh, leadership committees and so forth to have advance that. The third one, the third obstacle is, uh, you know, heck, the one I probably ch was challenged most by is I had no capital, right? So I had this dream of, in 1983, starting a company, but, you know, um, had no earthly idea about how I was going to get the money. So here's what happened. I tell Ken, I think he's probably telling me, you know, he's probably thinking she's got to get a job, you know? And uh, I create not a business plan, but a one sheet pro forma. And I take it to uh, uh, Bob Knopf and Mary Jane. And I remember, you know, it was in this little black folder. And um, he, I said, you know, he looked at it and, and he rubbed his chin. And in a very kind of soft voice, he said, hmm. I think this looks pretty good. I think we can help. And that was about all it took. And, uh, you know, we were able to take uh, really a modest amount of money by comparison today. And um, some parts, the largest part of that went to paying for a franchise fee, which we later got out of. But um, we were able to take $25,000 and, and start that first store. So a lot of, you know, a lot of just real, I can't say enough about the support that was given to us uh, and continues to be given to us throughout these years. The fourth one, you know, my daughter, Kristen, uh, she couldn't be here tonight. She's, she's uh, in Stone College. Um, she, you know, and the kids are so smart today. She said, Mother, where's your business plan? Did you have a business plan? I said, oh my God, you know, I didn't even get a business degree. I didn't start taking business classes until I graduated. I was still working at Northwestern and trying to figure out a business. I went back to, you know, got a couple of classes, you know, accounting and, you know. So I guess the bottom line there is, you know, I think that as I have grown, I have recognized the importance of learning. And I've been a student of the business ever since. And I have made it my, my business to know this industry. So um, our guys are the same way. We travel throughout the country. We talk to other top retailers. We go to conferences. I've been to plants throughout the country, through China, uh, through South Korea, I've seen some of the most sophisticated plants in the world. And uh, I think that success today and you know, successful living is all about learning and being open to learning. So that's kind of been my passion. That's kind of been one of the things that's kept me grounded is, is really trying to, um, you know, to try to keep stake with that. Um, and, and speaking with entrepreneurialism and um, young kids today, I have to say that I have never met more brilliant people coming out of school. So West Virginia, you guys must be doing a great job. I mean, I, I come in contact. These are my favorite, favorite people. I'll tell them all the time. We've got to get more interns, get involved with the universities, entrepreneurial programs. I, I can't say enough about the people in 
well, West Virginia's done a great job, I sat on the board last year, but the, the, the how smart they are, and yes, the business plans, and the and all the, you know, very important statistics and research that, that goes into that, and I, I think that, you know, as I, as I uh, look at the next, you know, my next career years, I'm going to be totally focused around how we advance entrepreneurs, how we take these kids in college, and how we help them basically have the opportunities that I have had, which is to live the American dream. You have to remember, right, that most jobs that are created today are done through entrepreneurs. 90%, 98%, I think it is, of the workforce are done through entrepreneurial companies. You also have to remember that most companies fail in the first year, right? And very few of them make it after 28 years. So I really, you know, when we started this business, I knew we would grow. I never thought for a second we would get to the point that we are at today. I, I come back to the point that, you know, the state of West Virginia has totally embraced our company. They have been nothing but incredible. And uh, it's been an honor to be here tonight. Um, it's been kind of, it's been a lot of fun. A lot of people have walked up and, and said hello. And I mean, I, I don't know if Bruce Berry's still here or not, but funniest story is, you know, he walked up and he said, well, I was your gynecologist. <laughs> and I said, well, really? I said, well, my, my oldest daughter is here. She's 25. It's Carrie. He said, well, it's been a long time since I saw her. <laughs> and I, I mean, it's just like it's just you're taken back by some of these very, very, very personal stories that kind of happy, happen along the journey of life. And I have had more doors open to me, my family, our employees uh, through this business. And I really do have to credit the state of West Virginia because it was here that this dream was born. Um, last, I'd like to, uh, you know, in, in, in trying to wrap this up, I know I've probably spoken longer than I should, and I've really tried to cut a lot of this out, but I really need to, to, to leave tonight saying that it is an honor and a privilege, something I never would have expected. Um, but in, in business, you know, you look and you think about stores and money and all that kind of stuff, but really what has stood out to me is, is my biggest accomplishment is that we've been able to grow this company. I've been able to do it with Ken, my husband, um, our two daughters, Carrie and Kristen, and our family and our employees. And, and all the other stuff, while it might be a measure of success, really the biggest measure of success is the relationships that you have. It's the people that you touch. And I, I, that, that, for me, is, is the biggest, the, the thing that gives me the most amount of pride, the most amount of joy. So I hope you guys enjoy our mattresses. <laughs> and I was very disappointed when I went to my room tonight and I had a sleep number bed. <laughs> and the worst part about the sleep number bed was that the motor was broke. <laughs> and I had to call maintenance and say this just, does not work. I'm a very, very picky mattress person. <laughs> Thank you very much. Very good. This is a wonderful story. Again, a story that this country needs so many more. Uh, we are in need of people like him who takes on the challenge and the risk to start businesses. Sometimes we forget how difficult it is to start a business. It is once, to, once that genie is out of, the bark, uh, out of the bottle, it's important to cultivate, to foment, to help. Uh, people sometimes in different places in the country think that businesses start off the trees, off the trees. They do not. It's tough to do it. And so for people like yourself, uh, Kim, thank you very much. And for employing so many West Virginians, thank you very much too. Appreciate it. <laughs> I'd like to call to the lecture now uh, Mr. Kim Craig, who will uh, introduce uh, the second inductee, Mr. Stuart Robbins. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, Stu, I'm going to be nice tonight. <clears throat> um, First, you know, when you're called by a good friend to do this type of introduction, do you often wonder, was I the first call or the last call? 
And I, you don't have to answer that, okay? And I'd prefer you not. But uh, good evening, everyone. And it is really my honor and privilege uh, tonight to introduce my good friend and the uh, next Hall of Fame inductee, Mr. Stuart M. Robbins. Uh, following Stu's graduation in 1965, Stu used his West Virginia University education to, to steadily climb the corporate ladder. He established himself as a respected and successful businessman and in a competitive environment of Wall Street and as an exemplary leader in his community. Stu was an industrious and talented student holding five academic scholarships and work-study grants. He went on to study law at New York University and advanced studies in business at the University of Pittsburgh, Boo, and Pace University. He has consistently been an enthusiastic leader in support of West Virginia University students. Stu began his distinguished career in the securities industry as a research and credit analyst with Mellon Bank. Through positions of Parker Hunter, C.S. McKee, and Payne Weber, to his final position as Managing Director of Global Equities at Donaldson, Lufkin, and Jen Brett. During his time at DLJ, he served as a member of the company's Executive Committee and eventually on the Board of Directors until his retirement in 2000. As an analyst, Stu was recognized by his peers and clients as one of the industry's best. During Stu's six-year term as the Research Director, the company survived the October 1987 market crash and then rebounded, seeing a period of growth in the 1990s. During that time, DLJ became known as the firm that research built largely due to Stu's leadership and influence. As managing director of global equities at DLJ, Stu managed one of the financial industry's most successful businesses. He was responsible for a worldwide division of over 1,500 people and revenues quadrupled during his six-year tenure. Under Stu's leadership, DLJ significantly added to its presence in the United States and embarked upon a major international expansion. Stu recruited a whole new generation of international leadership. The firm's success in Europe and the Far East was a testimony to his efforts and inspiration. Stu has also served on several boards of directors, including Credit Suisse, Diocese Corporation, World Street Corporation, Soundview Technology Group, LaBranch and Company, and the WVU Foundation. Stu is also involved in several charitable and community organizations, such as the Planning Board of Stanford, Connecticut, the Charter Revision Commission of Stanford, Connecticut, Common Cause, the Stanford Museum and Nature Center, the Stanford Symphony, the Greenwich uh, Shakespeare Society, the NAACP, and the Connecticut Civil Liberties Union. Stu has also given of his time to the following associations. Nominating Committee for the Association of the Investment Management Research, Financial Analyst Federation, New York Society for Securities Analysts, Past President of the Merchandising Analyst of New York, National Retail Merchants Association, National Mass Retailing Institute, and the International Council of Shopping Centers. My wife would like that. Okay. <clears throat> In addition uh, to volunteer service and activities, Stu has given of his time and financial resources generously to West Virginia University. In 1983, Mr. Robbins started his long-term relationship with the Everly College of Arts and Sciences. At this time, he began serving as a member of the advisory board. He's also served as a guest lecturer for the Everly College Honor Student Program. He expanded his service to WVU in 1991 when he accepted the position at the, on the WVU Foundation Board of Directors. In 1997, he increased his responsibility by accepting the position of the chair of the investment committee. In 2001, Mr. Robbins accepted the role as vice chair of the National Campaign Committee for the Foundation Building Greatness Campaign. In 2003, Mr. Robbins was elected chairman of the West Virginia New Foundation Board of Directors. Mr. and Mrs. Robbins created the Stewart and Joyce Robbins Scholarship Endowment in December of 1998, benefiting the WVU Scholars Program. They created the endowment fund established by the 
established by the Stuart and Joyce Robbins Chair, the first to benefit West Virginia University History Department in 2001. They have also created the Stuart M. and Joyce N. Robbins Presidential Endowment and recently created the Stuart M. and Joyce N. Robbins Center for Global Business and Strategy 20-21 and the Stuart M. Robbins and Joyce N. Robbins Distinguished Professorship in Epidermiology. In total, Mr. and Mrs. Robbins have provided more than $5 million in support to West Virginia University. Do, uh, those conclude my formal introduction. Pretty impressive credentials, might you say. Uh, however, you know, I needed to do something a little informal. You know, Stu and I, I think, are friends and hopefully will remain friends after a couple more remarks. But uh, you'll likely notice when Stu stands up that he's a rather tall person. And, um, you know, that's sometimes humbling and intimidating when you first meet him. And so, um, you know, after we've spent a considerable amount of time over the last few years and a number of meetings, I kind of came to the resolution, why is Stu so, so, so tall? And what I really discovered, Stu, it's, it's all about the, you need to have the large frame to store your kindness, generosity, energy, and compassion. And so it is my, Real pleasure to introduce my friend, Stu Robbins. Thanks, Kim. I don't know if you know it or not, but you've just seen uh, the Mountaineer's biggest fan and the volunteer probably most responsible for business and economics research and my good friend, Kim. I am honored and a bit daunted particularly since I'm an arts and sciences grad, uh, which has been pointed out many times by Zito. But I think tonight Michelle Wheatley figured it out. We were talking and you see it was a light year. And they got down at the bottom of the barrel and Jim Dobbs decided to go by height. <laughs> I actually can't believe I deserve something like this for in my career doing exactly what I wanted to do, for never being bored, and for every, every morning wanting to get up and go to work. I need you to step back and say something. America's a great country. Huh? Yeah. I'm the grandson of a Lithuanian immigrant who came here when he was nine years old, having seen both his parents die in Russia as an orphan, and other Russian immigrants who were separated from their families. And I'm the son of a father who had a fourth grade education and never made more than $3,500 a year in his life as a peddler. I'm Russian, Polish, Lithuanian, and Jewish, married to Irish, Scotch, English, and Methodist. <laughs> Our kids are Heinz 57 varieties, and if that isn't America, I don't know what is. Let me begin by thanking those who were foolish enough to give me this honor. Hall of Fame Committee, b and &E, and all of the other dignitaries are here. I guess I'm living proof that you can fool most of the people some of the time and some of the people most of the time. <laughs> My wife and children express regrets that they can't be here with me. They have a family conflict, but I did get some instructions. My daughter said, no silly ties, Dad. My wife said, please, no dumb jokes. But my five-year-old granddaughter came up with the best one. She said, Papa, if you had behaved better, maybe they would let you stay in the room instead of the hall. <laughs> I am 68 years old, and it's been a quite a ride for me. Fifty-four years ago, I took my first job at the age of 14 cleaning toilets at Fisher Brothers Dry Goods at the Park Shopping Center in Parkersburg. At that time, all I wanted to do was finish high school. I thought if I made, ever made $100 a week, I'd be a rich man. And it was clear I wasn't going to make it as an athlete, since I think I led the state and most times fouled out in a single season. And I wasn't a leverly either, but that's another story. As I said, my dad was a hardworking peddler who never really had much to show for it. And I had nowhere to go but West Virginia University. 
Indeed, I am one of those kids the ACC should have remembered when they stuck their nose up at land-grant achievements. <laughs> I waited tables. I worked construction. I did a steady graveyard shift at uh, Kaiser Lemon. I bartended. I was a bouncer. I cleaned fish. I even shilled for a Teflon pan salesman on the boardwalk. And I had 17 jobs in Atlantic City trying to work myself through school. Not doing much good in Atlantic City except earning money, but I did do one very good thing, and that is I met my wife of 43 years. And as Joyce would say, thank you. As Joyce would say, it's been all uphill since. <laughs> but no, make no mistake, at WVU I got a great education. Not just for academics, but for life's experiences and lifelong friendships, some of whom are here tonight, including my oldest and dearest friend, Mort, who's somewhere out there. I came in as an 18-year-old who could barely walk and chew gum at the same time. And I came out with a better education than I knew and a real preparation for life. Looking back, I remember how green I was. With the exception of a couple of trips to New York by car to see relatives, I'd never been to Pittsburgh. I'd never been on a plane. I'd never even eaten a piece of pizza. And I thought Marriott, Ohio, 12 and a half miles away from Parkersburg, where I was raised, was really far. In fact, I remember in 1982 when I ran the New York Marathon thinking, this is twice as far as Marietta. <laughs> But at West Virginia, I had great deans and wonderful professors. I remember an English professor who taught me the love of words. I took a journalism elected, elective and was thrilled by writing. I had a bunch of history professors who taught me analytical thought, comparative analysis, and appreciation of events around me. And late in college, I decided to take some electives in economics and accounting. I didn't know it at the time, but they would provide a great foundation for my later career, and much to my surprise, I liked them. Now, I feel I have to justify this honor, although I'm humbled by Kim's kind words. I guess I feel like the older I get, the better I was. <laughs> um, but I spent four decades on, in and about Wall Street, and I enjoyed a career that was marked by unbelievable opportunities, great support, and not a little luck. It started when I thumbed back to Pittsburgh from New York with the clothes on my back and a suitcase full of dirty underwear because my friend Mort was going to let me sleep on his couch and it wasn't a good mattress. <laughs> I conned my way onto the Mellon Bank training program and along the way I was assigned to investment research and that became, began a lifelong love of the investment business. Eventually from Mellon, with two partners and friends, I started, we started our own research effort with Parker Hunter, where we started by buying desks from Goodwill, and we cold called Wall Street. We were the analysts, the traders, the salespeople, the back office, and the janitors. And Wall Street clients thought we had 30 people, but there were three of us. <laughs> and indeed, to this day, I think one of the largest trades that was ever done at Parker Hunter, I did on the Delaware Turnpike at three phone, phone booths, one with JP Morgan, one with Chase Manhattan, and one with our office, and I can remember the J.P. Morgan traders saying, you guys must be busy, it's really loud there. <laughs> <laughs> now for you old timers, particularly for you, those were days when there were no personal computers, there were no calculators. We used slide rules. We didn't have push button phones, we used the old black rotaries. We had no fancy copy machines, no fax machines. We were barely past the old mimeographs that I can still smell the blue ink from. We wrote by longhand or we typed on the old typing machines. But what we did find out is we understood relationships and that those relationships make success. And it's not about equipment, it's about people. Now ultimately, all the stuff you read about about Wall Street and all the bad stuff reported to me. <laughs> Sales, trading, research, derivatives, corporate finance, quantitative trading, international, all the bad stuff you read about. But whatever you hear about it, I can tell you that it was like any other profession. 95% of the people were trying to make an honest living and do right and do it honestly. 
And in fact, I'm proud that of the jobs that we created, the profits that we distributed, the new markets we opened, the companies we energized, and the charities we gave to. And that's from a Democrat. <laughs> now, there's very little that I did, however, that I had appropriate experience for. I was always learning on the job. And let me tell you, there's very little to prepare you for visiting 16 cities in eight days across Europe or Asia. There's very little help that you can get in advance of negotiating a deal between a Saudi Arabian investment group and an Israeli venture capital firm. There's very little to get one ready for Russian authorities, Taiwanese bribe artists, quantitative algorithms and nerds, Chinese 100-year business plans, or dealing with the likes of Michael Bloomberg, Carl Icahn, Mishulam Rickless, Bernie Marcus, Sam Walton, and yes, Donald Trump. On any given day at the end of my career, we had a billion and a half, that's a billion and a half, of inventory in multiple currencies across the world. Now you learn to deal with that, but you never quite get used to the fact that you will make multi-hundred million dollars decisions in under 30 seconds. As my wife says, when Hong Kong calls at 3 o'clock in the morning, it's never good news. <laughs> The action of the transaction, the intricacy of the projects, the interaction with brilliant clients and heady employees was all adrenaline generating and something to this day I still miss. Well, I may not have been properly experienced, but I did have the ultimate preparation. And that was West Virginia and WVU roots and values. And they're called hard work. They're called no exceptions honesty. And they're called a strong belief in treating people right because that comes back to you every time. Now at DLJ, we became a worldwide equity force. And we were top five in virtually all of the businesses we were in. And I had the great, great, great privilege of managing a billion and a half dollar business with 1,650 people operating in 24 countries, doing business in uh, 24 offices, doing business in 24 countries and doing business six and a half days a week, 18 hours a day, in multiple languages across all of the most sophisticated trading devices. But I'll tell you something. I never once felt non-competitive because of my degree from West Virginia University. I never once felt undereducated. I never once felt academically deprived. I always felt able to take on whatever strong challenge there was, and for sure, I benefited from those good old-fashioned WVU Mountaineer Foundations. Again, as my wife says, you can take the boy out of the country, but you can't take the country out of the boy. Now, you do learn things along the way, although sometimes they're funny. Maybe you can explain to me how a merchant in a Hong Kong market and an Israeli cab driver, upon, both upon seeing my flying WV baseball cap, went, go Mountaineers. <laughs> I still don't understand it. You do learn something, things that always work. And they're simple, and they've already been talked about tonight. One is always do your best. I can still feel, hear my father saying, a job worth doing is worth doing well. A second is always be optimistic and can do. You cannot grow any business and be a pessimist. I must tell you, at one point in my career, we were about $200 million in revenues, making about $25 million in pre-tax profits. And in, 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 in a worldwide presentation, I said, we will be a billion-dollar company um, a, a globally. And afterward, my right arm said to me, you have no facts to prove that. And my left arm said, you have no logic to support that. And I said, you're absolutely right, but they'll do it. And they did. The next thing you need to know is you need to always ask what if. What can go wrong with what's right? What can go right with what's wrong? Never in your career follow conventional wisdom. You need to surround yourself with people who are better than you. They will make you look good. You need to manage to succeed, not manage not to fail, meaning you have to take risks along the way. And you always have to follow a discipline plus process that believes in yourself, using your heart and your gut, not just your brain. Now, I've tried enough to stop that since I was so-called retired in 2000, although my wife would dispute the word retirement. I think I flunked it. Since that time, I've had two stints as board chairman with companies I knew nothing about to begin with, several private investments, numerous charities, a bad golf game, and doing everything I possibly can for West Virginia University. 
And now, let me talk a little bit about that. Let me start about talking about WVU, and let me talk about B&E for a moment. B&E is in a remarkable spurt of progress, achievement, and recognition. And if you think Zito Sardarelli isn't the best thing we've ever had at B&E, you need to see what's going on there. Dean Sardarelli and his minions, all of the people who are here and not here, who help him, I want you to think about this. In a year, a four-year business school, a two-year MBA, a broader PhD program, an electronic MBA that is expanding, a broadened academic center, beginners of a beginning of an international force, and tremendous enthusiasm, high morale, and yes, top 100. We will be at B&E, top 50. We will be the center of environmentalism and change, and we will be known as a recruiting place of choice. Now let me come to WVU. I've said it before, we are on the cusp of